you know, that sounds real familiar. And then I was listening to Sam Harris on one of his. I was like, that's it. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and today I am joined via the internet to California with a new guest that you haven't had on the show before, someone that you may not know of, uh, but he's a very interesting person in the world of motorsports and racing and sponsorships, more specifically. Uh, he has a full-on book that he's written about sponsorship, and he has a bunch of online uh, classes you can take about uh, getting sponsored and what it means to be sponsored. Uh, and he frequently talks with you know industry leaders, brand representative, CEOs, things like that. So we're going to dive into a little bit of who he is, uh, what he does, where he's from, what he's doing, and some interesting new opportunities that you can take uh, with him and learn more about the process of being sponsored. So uh, today, uh, welcome, uh, Alex uh, Stryler. How's it going, Big Z? Doing pretty good. Excited <laughs> to have you on finally. I followed you um, a while back about, uh, I don't know, about a year ago when I started seeing these videos that you were putting out about uh sponsorships and mm -hmm. what uh what they meant but you have a big long backstory of working in the motorsports and racing world uh give us a little bit of uh intro to who you are what you're doing uh where you come from you know maybe some of your experience in this world and industry and and kind of what you've been doing the last uh 10 15 years I'd, I'd say the last 10, 15 years have gone by really fast. It started maybe 20 years ago. I, I came from investment banking where I worked uh, in New York City, lived in Philly, and then commuted back and forth. Uh, kind of got tired of that. So came to California, started an internet business, which morphed into me working with other action sports brands. I ended up becoming the president of a, a shoe company back in those days, and we sponsored a lot of athletes. So that, that got me into athlete management, sponsorships, knowing where value was, and understanding what companies want from sponsorship. Then a friend of mine around 2004, 2005, uh, someone I knew from, since the college days, he called and said, hey, I just took this job with a race promoter, a guy who, uh, a very rich person who bought a racing series and wants to bring it to California. Do you want to come join us? And at the time, I didn't think much about it. And then I looked at the numbers in racing and Dale Earnhardt Jr. was making as much money as the revenue of the company that I was working for. So I was like, you know, this is interesting. <laughs> if, if one athlete can make as much money as this entire company with 30 employees, um, it, you know, I took a look. Next thing you know, I'm working there with them. And that was when championship off-road racing went from the Midwest uh, and expanded out to California. And so I joined CORE and got involved with selling sponsorships for uh, the series, which at the time it was mostly sponsorships for endemic brands, endemic companies, you know, aftermarket automotive companies. But uh, our goal was to try to bring in some of the action sports brands that I had dealt with uh, as a shoe proprietor. And so with age comes the cage and a lot of freestyle <laughs> motocrossers and a lot of the action sports athletes were jumping into rally cars and off road. And so it started soliciting brands like Monster and Red Bull and Rockstar and DC Shoes and some of the other non endemics to traditional motorsports. And now 20 years later, those are some of the bigger names in racing. So it was the right target, I think, at that time. So were you fully focused on that kind of like off road or racing scene in that aspect? Or was it a little bit bigger and broader than that? Because right now, if you go look up Alex Dreiler online, you're going to see a lot of PR, PRI, you're going to see a lot of, right. um, you know, asphalt <laughs> stuff. Uh, it kind of gives us the, the runaround on that. Yeah, it started with off-road. From 05 to 08, 2008 is when Championship Off-Road Racing closed down. It turns out that the owner was funded by Lehman Brothers. He had a line of credit from Lehman, and that's how he funded the operations. And when the market collapsed and Lehman Brothers went out of business, he lost his line of credit. Suddenly, the race series that we were all working for closed its doors, and it was a surprise and a right. shock. Um, I did write a book kind of about the, the convergence of action sports uh, and motorsports, and I was trying to educate uh, some of my friends back in investment banking that there's an opportunity, you know, in this industry to invest. So I wrote a book called Explanation. It was an explanation of action sports that it was my way of trying to educate people that there's an opportunity here. Well, after that, I, I ended up joining Lucas Oil and worked for Lucas for almost a decade uh, in a program called Team Lucas. And Team Lucas was the marketing arm of Lucas Oil where we created events, over 400 events a year. Uh, they were televised on almost all the, the sports networks. 
and across many disciplines. Uh, Lucas at the time owned or operated eight different racing series, everything from off-road, drag boats, sprint cars. There, there was a lot going on at Lucas. So yes, um, it started with off-road and then it went to all racing. And in sponsorships, the principles apply to any discipline. Um, getting sponsors and writing decks, creating proposals, the, those same concepts apply no matter whether you're on asphalt, circle track, dirt, motocross, or even sim racing. You know, many, many of the principles I think can be taught and learned over time. And that's kind of what I'm doing now is after Lucas, I started taking my business um, online and I'm trying to educate racers and anybody, any, any athlete that's looking for help from corporate end, you know, how to do that. What is it that companies want from sponsorship? What do they want in return? And so now I'm creating content, online content. Yeah. And it, it's kind of refreshing to see somebody out there taking an effort to put out some quality content, not just, you know, sitting at their kitchen table, putting together, you know, their thoughts or whatever the case is. Uh, it looks like you, you guys are putting on uh, at least a decent amount of effort to put on quality, high quality visual and audio content for these people that have real deep um meaty context that they can dig into. Uh, before we jump into some of that, uh, kind of give me uh, maybe some of your favorite memories of, of working with Lucas Offroad and, and all that stuff. Because, you know, in, in our industry with the with the Razors and the, the, the UTVs and side-by-side -side racing and all that stuff, mm -hmm. uh, Lucas Offroad has been over traditionally the last few years, been a big name in what series you go to. And recently they've done a, a quite a bit big turnaround on how they were structuring and, and where they're going to be racing and all that stuff. Uh, how has the, how has that changed over the years? What have you seen happen uh, back in the days when, when the off-road racing scene was kind of fresh with side-by-sides and all that stuff where it wasn't really, you know, where it's at now where the last three or four years has really exploded. Um, you know, kind of give some perspective of, of what you've seen back then and how it's transitioned to now. So I, I remember back at core around 2005, 2006, when, Nestor and Tony, Nestor Brardy and, and Tony, they came and they, they had this new thing called a trophy cart. Nestor was creating trophy carts. Tony was the, the series promoter and creating a racing series for youth to race in these. And we thought, wow, this is really cool because this could be the feeder series that trains future racers for the bigger Pro 2 and Pro 4 trucks. And that started to really grow. Now, now you have modified carts and that class of racing and that genre of getting younger people in cars actually started morphing around the same time when companies like Polaris were making razors and pretty damn good ones, I have to say, race ready. Yamaha was making uh, rhinos early back in the day, but you couldn't really race them. When Polaris came out with the razor, it really changed things. And next thing you know, there's a UTV class in some of the Lucas series. And Lucas embraced the, the UTV racing, all forms of racing, anything that could develop future talent, because you see a lot of the young racers that started back in the trophy cart days. You look at Mitchell DeYoung, he's iRacing champion. Look at Haley Deegan, look at Sheldon Creed. You look at these guys that started out there that are now champions in their, their sports that are not necessarily still in off-road or on dirt. So I saw how the industry progressed. And when side-by-sides and UTVs became as functional as they are today, it was just a natural tool to teach racers of the future, athletes who want to do this for a living and, and not just part time on weekends, but people who actually want to make a living out of this. They can start with uh, almost a factory, you know, off the floor, side by side with a few upgrades and a few protection modifications. And they can get in and literally race on the same race tracks, dirt tracks that professionals race. And then that builds the talent. And as that talent builds, then it grows. Um, so side-by-sides are not just for desert riding. That's what we do with ours. We like to go to the desert, but uh, a lot of racers are using them to train to become better in their profession. So the transition of youth to, you know, young adult racer to experienced racer, um, you know, back in the, the 2000, I don't know, eights to 2012s, uh, really yeah. started with the idea that they were getting their hands dirty with mom and dad, you know, on the race course with their cars or their big trucks or their whatever they were racing. And then they kind of grew up with the sport, right? Like they kind of grew up yeah. with the buggies and the technologies and the suspensions and the shocks and the, all these different things that contribute to your ability to race in the different classes of racing to where before there was one series and there was three, you know, or classes and there was two or three classes and there was <laughs> turbo classes. And now there's, now we're looking at open and unlimited classes, right? 
Um, but the, the thing that interests me is that the, those young racers grew up with the technology, kind of like I did with computers, right? I was at the forefront right, of, right. you know, 286, 386 computers, and then mine's blown when I got my 586 Cyrix chip, whatever. <laughs> and, you know, I, I started my, I grew up with the technology. I fundamentally understand it from the ground up, uh, even into today's mobile phones and stuff. So these, you, these racers, they grew up with not having suspension, then having suspension, then having bigger suspension, then having really high quality internal bypass shocks and then, you know, turbo kits and all these other different things. Young racers nowadays, people that are joining into the sport now, they're jumping in with the high technology, with the growth, yeah. with the bad boy cars, with, with, with these big race series, with these big corporate sponsorships, where back in the day, there really wasn't a lot of that. Um, how has that changed for you as how, how you perceive sponsorship and how you perceive these young racers or even just older people trying to get into the sport? They're getting in at a point where it's not growing like it used to. It's just more mature now. And so the approach is a little bit different on how you train, how you experience, how you buy in, and what you need to reach for for sponsorships. How has that all changed for you in your perspective? Well, what's, what's interesting is that, you know, in any sport, if you practice with good equipment, you'll get better faster than if you practice with bad equipment because it, it allows you to perform better. And so youth today and, and racers today that are practicing with these side-by-side -side, new UTVs, they're getting better experiences than just a decade ago when that option wasn't available. So they're, they're accelerating faster in their professional growth, which then allows them to spend more time being a professional and representing as a professional. And when you're a professional, you're potentially be a brand ambassador for companies that want to associate with you. So by getting faster, better in their sport, they, they literally become brand ambassadors quicker. And so they're learning sponsorship at a young age way faster than most you know racers from 20 years ago were thinking about sponsorships youth today are online as well so not only are they creating content through their racing or through whatever activity they're doing but youth know how to promote that to their friends and followers online through social so social has changed a lot social media um, social media is a big part of sponsorships today not because of the number of followers somebody has um, and it's interesting, I've, I've had a personal experience where I promoted through two very large groups, one that had 40,000 members, one that had 30,000 members, and those promotions had weaker results than another exact same promotion I did through George Hamill's Dirt Life show. George has far less followers, but he had three times the performance because his followers are endemic. So the what, what we're learning is that the smaller endemic core followings where a lot of these racers can be in position and, and participate in, they have far better results for sponsors um, in terms of activity, in terms of engagement than some of these massive organizations with a lot of followers and a lot of members that really result in no marketing follow through. So things have changed in that anybody now with a camera can create content. Anybody with an internet connection can upload that content and anybody with friends and connections online can share that content. So the world has changed in our reach and our ability to reach more people, but those people who are in it first and creating that content and active in doing it are the ones who are succeeding and getting ahead. Anybody can do it nowadays. You, you don't even have to race to promote for a sponsor. You just have to create content. Racing is the, the, the credibility, the legitimacy. It's that backbone. It's the foundation. Um, but you don't have to race. So if you are racing and you're good and you're creating content, that's like the trifecta. Now, now you, there's no reason for brands not to sponsor you if you can create value for them. Yeah, and I, I think you you hit on the key point is is that engagement, right? That's the metric that most of these people are looking for. It's not necessarily that your your post got out to a hundred thousand followers or or right. whatever. It's right. that they they engaged in some way. It was more than just a mindless swipe. It was it was actually stopping, looking, tapping, liking, right. commenting, whatever. That's more important these days. Um, yeah. and, and I was thinking about that because I just had on um, uh, Lindsay Geyser who does a lot of off-road marketing for some some power sport businesses yes. around your area. Um, and we were talking about how, you know, it's more important that you just pull your iPhone out and start posting less so than it is to spend $50,000 on a fully blown media package, right? Like it's more important that you generate that content and that connection with the audience than it is 
to show off or to appear to be at a certain yes. level. Yes. That's more yes. important. And, and that audience and that engagement is, is the most important. And that kind of leads me into a thought that I was thinking, um, you know, prepping for the show, I was trying to think about, you know, various different angles that, that I've been looking at the industry. And I was, I just saw that, uh, uh, you work with PRI and, and, and some of the different yes. companies, which is, you know, correlated with SEMA and some of those other or- big organizations. Um, and they just opened up a new building down there in, in, um, Indianapolis. Right. And, uh, And so I was watching their press release video and all that stuff that goes with it. And, and it got me thinking about racing, asphalt racing and off-road racing and how they differ. Uh, and one of the biggest things that I can see is different is asphalt racing, whatever the discipline is, whatever the series you're in has a lot of cachet to it, has a lot of like corporate, like, you know, if we're in this series and we're in the top 10, then we, we feel like we've succeeded in our, in our mission. Right. Uh, where the off-road world is a lot more about grassroots and family connection and community connection and, you know, uh, personality tie-in and, you know, things like that. Kind of give me your perspective on, you know, being in the behind the scenes, somebody that's worked directly with both angles. You know, how how does the asphalt industry differ from the off-road industry and what are some of the things we should be looking at as an off-road community? In, in terms of the passion by the participants, it's the same. The asphalt community has just as passionate racers. They love the sport. The families love the sport. It is a weekend event for them, usually on, on memorialized weekends and, and days, times when they always go. Um, but in off-road, because that's it's more what I grew up with, and all of our children have motorcycles. We have a couple of razors. We, we, we have a desert house, so we are off-roaders. Um, it is our lifestyle. We, when we go to King of the Hammers or we go to the Mint 400, we'll sometimes take our razor with us. King of the Hammers, we end up staying in a toy hauler and spend the, the whole week there and drive around in the razor in the morning and watch the event in the afternoon. So we're part of the event instead of a spectator of the event. And I don't know if that's the same with asphalt racing because I haven't gone as a participant in asphalt racing where no one in my family ever raced asphalt. Um, but I'm pretty sure that the families that do race, they're, they're, they're at the racetrack, you know, all week long, kind of like we are in off-road. The, the, the difference, I think, is when you go to King of the Hammers, the spectators can bring their vehicle because there's room in the desert to set up and to camp. And so you can do that. Now, I haven't seen too much of that in organized races at tracks because there's limited space. When it comes to how the different series utilize media or represent sponsors, um, I think it's all about the same. It does seem that it wasn't until rally racing came on board, but I guess that's technically more off-road than, than street, um, the GRC and WRC. It wasn't until then that you saw the action sports athletes start to, to decorate their cars with cool graphics instead of just logos and numbers. Usually in, in circle track racing or asphalt racing, you saw a lot of logos on cars and the cars are identified by numbers. Well, that started to change when when Ken Block and Travis Pastrana and Tanner Faust and Deegan and those guys came in. Now the cars started to become associated with graphics and coolness and brands and even drivers instead of numbers. So there is a little bit of a difference there. And I think the side-by-side market tends to follow the rally market in that most most side by sides, especially when you go to the the races, they're cool looking. You know, the graphics look good. the The industry understands this aspect of style, and a lot of sponsors like that. Some sponsors don't care because you know they might be a endemic parts brand that they don't care about style. But in the fashion sense, some of the cooler brands, they're trying to sell cool. They're trying to sell lifestyle, and that's why you see brands like Monster on board a lot of these cars is because. Monster is not selling soda. Monster is selling coolness. It's selling a lifestyle. And if they can attach to cool lifestyles, let's say through side-by-side off-roading or, you know, now when Lucas canceled their off-road racing series, a couple other series popped up to take over the the Lucas Oil Regional Off-Road Series, which is where all the side-by-sides race. That's now the Great American Short Course Series run by Lee Perfect. And you go there and you can see just the graphics and the style of the teams, they get it. They they understand the, the creativity is necessary for a lot of brands. The bigger brands get involved and they represent that way. So that's sort of where I see the difference. I, I think circle track and asphalt racing will catch up because soon they'll also learn, you know, it is more about image than it is just about exposure. 
Um, 10, 20 years ago, exposure meant a lot in the world because if you were winning, you got the most exposure, you were on television, you were in magazines. Today, you, you don't need to sell exposure. In fact, I discourage even using the word in a deck or a proposal. Um, exposure is the last thing most brands want. They want that activation we were just talking about. They want the engagement, they want sales, they want B2B relationships, they want hospitality opportunities where they can send some of their VIPs and vendors. So there's a lot to sponsorships, but exposure isn't one of them. And if you are trying to establish brand equity for a company, you want to elevate your own brand equity. And to do that, you have to look cool. And I think the side-by-side -side industry does a great job from action sports in doing so. One of the things that I tell guys that are, you know, trying to put together their package of racing or, or whatever their niche is, is that just like I did, you know, a few years ago, I had to come out of my shell and become a little bit more of an outrovert instead of an introvert, right? <laughs> and I think that's what you're saying is that, you know, it's not just purely about numbers, it's about the personality behind the camera and being able to represent both who you are, what you're doing, and those that are helping you get there. And that's what I think is interesting about someone like, you know, Monster is like, I've worked with them before, you know, in some of the events that I've worked with in the past that they're like, we can't show, we don't want to show anybody drinking the drink. Like, just do not show the can in anybody's mouth. We only want it shown held or placed somewhere. The rest of it needs to be you and what you're doing. And it was interesting. I, I was taken back by that. It's like, it's not that you, they want to see the person drinking the thing anymore. And side note, it's a little behind the scenes. A lot of those cans are full of water. Uh, the, <laughs> yes, they are. Uh, and it says on the very top, Monster Tour Water. It'll say that on the can <laughs> if you read it real close. You know, there's a funny story on that one is, so maybe 10 years ago, I was in Mark Hall's office. Mark's the president of Monster Energy. He kind of created the brand to where it is today. And I forget what we were talking about, but he hands me a drink and it was a Monster Energy and I opened it up and he was waiting for the reaction because I didn't know this, but it was filled <laughs> with water. It was a Monster Tour water. And I took a sip and I was like, whoa. And I looked at him like, I think your manufacturing plant screwed <laughs> up on this one. And he just kind of smiled and he goes, look real close at the letters. And if you look real close, right at the lip, right, right around the rim, it'll say monster tour water. Yeah. So that was a, that was a, a, a enlightening to me because when most spectators see an athlete on stage drinking from that can, it's usually tour water. And maybe it's a little bit of false marketing. I don't know. I think it's very clever marketing, but, but <laughs> well, I think uh, it's more interesting that, you know, the athletes have gotten to a point over the last 10 years, I think if I, my dates are right, they've gotten more important, more interested in being physically acute and accurate and strong and yeah. long endurance and all that stuff and putting in tons of sugar and carbs into their body. Uh, isn't always the best thing, especially when their body is in that recovery mode. They need the better <laughs> stuff, right? And uh, especially after a long race, if, if you got a racer that's just been out gruelly, pounding away, he needs what he needs is water, right? He doesn't need to be inundated with carbonation and, and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I just thought it was interesting that, um, you know, basically the brands that are big enough to put big endorsement deals on athletes aren't necessarily like you said looking for the exposure they can pay for their own exposure right that's not the problem they're looking for how you live what you're doing and the passion you have behind it. and i think the word passion gets a little bit overused sometimes as a marketing gimmick but it's really an accurate word for what they're looking for they're wanting to translate your passion through their product image branding whatever the case may be they, they want you to be credible and legitimate if, if you're real Tony Alba told me this maybe 25 years ago. I took Tony on a couple different skateboard tours back when I first came over and started my internet business. And, uh, and Tony would always say, just be real, be real. Because here I am from New York and I was a Wall Street guy and I'm trying to you know, be cool in the skateboarding industry. Didn't even know what that meant because I was not a skateboarder at the time. <laughs> and he's like, just be real. Doesn't matter who you are. Be you, be real. At the time, I didn't get it. Now I totally get it because if you're trying to pretend to be somebody you aren't, it comes across as illegitimate and, and not, it's just not sincere. So when, when you can convey your personality accurately through media and there's media everywhere now. So, you know, camera's always on, you, you should always be smiling. Then if you can accurately convey that and a sponsor sees, oh, that's the personality that we're trying to reach or we're trying to reach people who migrate towards that personality, then brands will attach to it. 
Um, you can be the tough guy. You can be the good guy, the smart guy, the analytical guy. You can be the sweet, sensational, whatever. It doesn't matter. If, if you have a certain style and personality, let that come through your media. And some sponsor will see that and appreciate it and will attach themselves to it. And I That's think the it, beauty of today is we can do anything. And the nice thing about that is that there's room for everybody, right? Like yeah, exactly. there's not only two or three sponsors out there. There's thousands of sponsors that are willing to work with people that have that authenticity, that passion to bring to the table. And just because they sponsor one person, you know, racer X doesn't mean they don't have room for extra racer Y, as long as they complement each other in some way where they're not the same thing. It, it's, it's true because everybody has different followers, but e even if you have the same followers, you might have them for different reasons. Right. Um, one athlete might be known for technical skills. Another athlete might be known for driving skills. Another athlete might be known for mechanical skills. So they may be followed by the same fan or spectator, but that fan or spectator is trying to learn different things from each athlete. So yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Find your niche and, and stay within that niche and be the best that you can. And naturally you'll have followers and those followers you can use to create value for sponsors. Everything comes down to creating value for sponsors using the tools that we have today. We have more tools today than we ever had, and certainly that were available 10 years ago. So it, it is leveling the playing ground for a lot of people, leveling the field for those who are taking advantage of those tools and using them to create value for sponsors. It's not just about finding a sponsor, it's about keeping the sponsor. And you keep sponsors by creating value for them. And, and different sponsors want different things. You know, a retailer wants foot traffic into the store. A manufacturer wants to prove functionality. A uh, service company wants to promote hours and services and, you know, what is it that they do? Um, every, every type of company needs something different. And, and earlier where I said don't offer exposure because most companies don't want that, well, that's not 100% not true. Young <laughs> companies and new companies, they do want exposure. New brands that no one's ever heard of, yes, new, new companies. But typically those are very small with no money, so you're not going to get a lot of money from them anyway. You might get some free T-shirts and hats. But if you're going for the big money, you need to go for the big company, and big companies don't need exposure. They, they need a lot of things, but not exposure. And so that's, that's one of the things I do now is I try to help racers and, and educate athletes uh, about what companies want and how to help them create that value so that they can get paid for their service as a brand ambassador. And I think you, you, you cued into something that I think is important because in our niche of the world, in our racing niche, there's a lot of those little brands that do want some exposure. They, they'll send you the free product to put on the car and whatever. And that's all great. But like you said, you have to start maturing at some point to get into deeper money and deeper pockets that can do more things and put you in more places uh, because ultimately that gives them more what they're looking for. Um, but you, you, you cued on something about learning. And I think it's important that a lot of these younger people that are, are learning the industry and learning their, their way of doing this via social media they assume they have to know everything and they assume they have to be good at everything and they have to uh, put on a certain show that goes along with that idea. Um, I think it's important that it's okay, that people know it's okay to learn along the way. It's okay to show that you are at this level and you're working to be at this level. And the way I got here was all these posts along the way, right? It's okay to learn. It's okay to be wrong. And it's okay to, it's just like racing, right? It's okay to not get first place. It's okay to not get a podium as long as you're learning and improving every single time you go out. I tell you what, I'm learning every day. This online stuff, this virtual stuff, um, it's all new to me. Even social media, and to a certain degree, is new to me. I, yes, I have a Facebook account. I have an Instagram account, but I don't use them so much to promote myself or anything I do. I use them to monitor my family and my children and see what my parents are doing and my cousins. So it's not a big commercial thing for me. But I have to say, a, a few months back, I had a young lady who's a two times drag racing champion and a world record holder, Megan Meyer. She's uh, an NHRA drag racer. And I interviewed her because she's also a social media coach. And I thought, oh, this is good. I'd like to learn about social media. And I'm sure that some of the people on meetthesponsors.com, it's a website where I interview professionals and athletes and, and brand managers about sponsorships. And I thought, okay, I think the audience would enjoy that. I tell you, I learned so much from that interview with Megan, everything from 
which angle to hold the camera, pixel resolution, the best times to send Instagram versus Facebook versus TikTok, and you know, the difference between those and LinkedIn. I learned so much about social media and, and the algorithms and how the algorithms will capture data and, and send it to more followers or less, depending on what you do, that I thought, wow, this is excellent. I, I learned so much that I'm including Megan in the sponsorship summit I'm doing next week as educating racers how to take advantage of that social media the, and the instructions and the tools that she teaches so that they can become better brand ambassadors and use social media. Just because you have Facebook or Instagram and post occasionally, that doesn't mean you're utilizing it right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, teaching racers how to use social media to create value for sponsors, that's the goal. And that's what Megan does outstanding. I mean, she's exceptional at it. So I learn all the time and I can't believe just how much I learned recently from someone <laughs> less than half my age who's already doing this. Right. So yeah, you just have to, you have to be open to learning. You have to be open to, to listening to people who maybe have a new way of approaching something that you've been doing a long time. There are some old school sponsorship guys who still think that a logo on the helmet, on the race suit, and on the race car has value. Um, you know, that was five, 10 years ago where that had a lot of value. Today, the value comes from what can you do for the brand to encourage more sales or raise its equity value? If you can't raise sales value through increasing the quantity of products that they sell, you can help a company raise its brand value through association. And that's the difference between a tangible asset or deliverable and an intangible. We have tangible assets as race drivers. We, we have the logos, we have magazine mentions, we have TV time, we have tickets that we can give out, but then we also have intangibles. Now the tangibles you can compare to other media or other assets that are the same. You get a half page, ad in a magazine or a half page write up it's about it's probably the same value as a half page article that you have to buy 30 seconds interview on television is probably worth 30 seconds of whatever commercial cost but the intangible values that's that's what raises you many times because intangibles like reputation like the strength of the series, the fan affinity, you know, how well do your followers like you? Those are priceless. You can't put a number on those. So if you can quantify your tangible assets and say, oh, wow, I only have $10,000 worth of assets to deliver to a sponsor, you may be able to put a zero behind that number and turn 10,000 into 100,000 if your intangibles have value. If your reputation and your integrity are so strong that your followers will listen to you and do what you say, like George Hamill on the Dirt Life show, he got three times as many, three times as much results as the two big institutions with lots of followers. That's an intangible value there. And a lot of racers don't even know that they can tap into that intangible value in order to increase the value of the sponsorship. They only add up their tangibles and then look for that much money. Gee, I have $10,000 worth to deliver. I need 10,000. Will you sponsor me for 10,000? When actually, if they were looking at it in a, from a different lens, a lens of intangible equity value, because a company wants to associate with it to raise the company's value, you, you know, Red Bull only associates with winners and champions. Average person cannot buy a Red Bull logo. You, you don't see Red Bull logos or hats for sale anywhere. If you see someone wearing Red Bull, they're a champion. They're a winner. Uh, they're sponsored by Red Bull. And so that raises the brand value of Red Bull because of that. So tangibles and intangibles are two different things. That, and we're going to talk about all that during the summit next week. Um, it's just things that I've learned over the years that others are not utilizing. There's a lot of resources that most racers have that they haven't tapped into yet. And if they did, they'd be raising a lot more money than they are today. So one of the things that our, our industry has is a lot of family racing, right? Like a bunch of yeah, really true. deep family racing. Um, and so what that does is it brings generations of people and experience together to accomplish one goal. And when we talk about sponsorships, right, a lot of times we'll get dads and moms and whatever's pushing their young ones to try to get these sponsorships and try to push them towards this, like this weird idea of what sponsorship is in their eyes. Uh, versus, you know, maybe what the actual industry is saying sponsorship is now. Um, and so I've seen a lot of people struggle with identifying 
you know, what they should be asking for and what they're looking to actually obtain through sponsorship and what they can actually provide. And you mentioned the intangibles and the tangibles and, and all that. How can people start to work towards a, a cohesive understanding as a family unit towards us or as a team unit um, to understanding what those are? Like, what's the difference between that tangible and intangible and how can they actually start to work together towards those goals? Well, first off, never ask for how much money you need. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I see, and it happens all the time, is a team needs thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars to get new parts for the car or for you know for to race for the season. So they ask for that much money. I need fifty thousand dollars to race. Will you sponsor me for fifty? That's not the way brands look at it. That's not the way companies look at it. They don't look at it as to how much money do you need? Gee, we'll give you that money. They look at it as how much value can you create for them? So you, what, what's very important is the valuation and knowing how to put a dollar figure on what a brand or a company might want from what you can give them. The deliverables that you have, the liver, your assets, the logos, the, you know, the, the appearances, and maybe cards that you hand out, posters, all that has a value. What is the value, not to you, but what's that value to that specific sponsor that you're approaching? Valuations are key because it's a very, very important part of putting together a, a proposal when you go to ask for money. And a proposal, by the way, don't confuse that with a deck. Decks and proposals are two totally different documents. A deck attracts attention. It gets a, a conversation started. It's what you use to meet somebody and get them interested in your race program. So decks are usually colorful and lots of words, a lot of images, or, or no words, lots of images. I said that wrong. And, and a deck is, is what brings them in and wants them to learn more. And then it starts that relationship. After you have a relationship and you know what the brand needs and the brand knows what you have, then you can propose to that brand. You propose an official business relationship through the deliverables that you outline and you put a dollar value on those deliverables based upon what it's worth to the company. And so how to create a deck, how to write a proposal, those are all topics that we talk about. Those are, those are things that racers need to learn and, and separate um, when they're approaching sponsors because I, you don't know how many times you see a, a company interested and say, okay, you know what, send me a proposal. I'd, I'd like to take a look. And then the racer sends a deck. Right. And that's not the right document. Or if you just meet someone for the first time and the guy's like, yeah, send me a deck. You know, I'd like to, I'd like to learn more about your program. And then the racer sends a proposal asking for money. Yeah, that's, that's why you don't get a callback is because you're sending the wrong document to the right person at the wrong time. You, you got to know how to create that deck and what goes in it, what's going to attract their attention, how to write the proposal when, when the time comes, and then how to value those assets in the proposal so that the sponsor looks at it and says, wow, you know, for $50,000, i am going to get $200,000 worth of media. This is a really good deal. I'm going to get a four times return. So that, I think, is one of the first things that racers need to learn is what their true value is, not necessarily how, what does it cost you to race. Most proposals I've seen are based on how much it costs someone to race and how much money they need. It's not based on what the sponsor gets in return if they had to buy that media out in, in the public. And I think it's important to be honest with those numbers. That's not, you know, it's not a big show that you're, you're you putting on a show to a sponsor is the wrong approach. Like if, if you're honest and, and accurate with your numbers, you know, they'll appreciate that. They know what the numbers are. They know what they to know expect. the numbers. Yeah. They know it way, well yeah. more than you do and probably yes. better than anyone around you do. So yes. so don't try to fluff the numbers because you'll get called out on that or just dropped completely out of the conversation. Be true. Be honest with what you're doing and don't try to hype yourself up because in, all, in the long run, they're going to see the return on that. If it doesn't match what they put up front. Like you said, they're not going to keep the sponsor. So, um, and it's funny because you're talking about the decks and the and the proposals. And I think that was one of the first videos that I saw of yours. Mm -hmm. and I think it was on MeetTheSponsors.com or somewhere like that. Uh, tell us a little bit about Meet the Sponsors, and then lead into you know what we got coming up next week with with your with your summit, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But tell us how Meet the Sponsors started and and what what you're doing there. Well, meetthesponsors.com started out of desperation because I sell sponsorships for a living and during COVID events closed down and there were no races that I could sell sponsorships for and the ones that I did sell didn't happen. So now there had to be some kind of a make good or deliverable for an event that didn't take place. So I did what many people did as I took my business online and I discovered this thing called 
podcasts and webinars <laughs> and yeah, we all did right you yeah. know I, I i read a statistic recently and i don't know how accurate it is but um something like over 50 percent of people now are making podcasts or have tried or have been on one where two years ago it would have been less than two percent so it's crazy just how much we've embraced this online media and don't quote those numbers because i'm pretty sure it was just from some cheesy website and they're probably not accurate <laughs> it was it was it, it was not an official source but the point is we're all online now and we're all making podcasts or we're all trying and so i did too and and my first attempt was with uh, a couple online educational programs where i would teach sponsorship lessons i went through a couple different back-end platforms that I couldn't figure out. They're very complicated for me. I finally just started doing webinars, which are nothing more than um, live interviews on screen. I call them webinars, but they were podcast interviews where I interviewed sponsors and asked them, what do you look for when you sponsor a race team? And what are some examples of what racers can do to increase their value to get you interested in sponsoring them? And then a lot of companies from Coca-Cola to Monster Energy, BF Goodrich, k and Filters, Lucas Oil, Permatex, AEM, they, they all joined. And in their words, the people who make those sponsorship decisions, I was educating racers on how to get sponsorships from those brands. Um, then the idea came, well, I do, you mentioned earlier, I, I'm associated with PRI. I've been for about eight years now. Um, a couple of years we didn't do it during COVID, but um, for about eight times, six, seven or eight times, I've hosted the educational seminar on sponsorships. And I did it this last time at PRI. I also do the president's panel. Um, I learned by giving these presentations what the topics are that interest racers. And it wasn't this la until this last PRI, there were some really good speakers and some great topics. And then after the, the week, PRI contacted me and said, hey, did you know that once again, your summit, your your seminar was the most attended seminar. I held the president's panel at PRI and the sponsorship panel at PRI. Actually, it was just a sponsorship presentation on proposals. The proposals presentation had five times as many attendees as the president's panel, which is fascinating because I had six presidents of major corporations on stage with me, but I had five times as many racers in the audience talking about sponsorships on my next seminar. So I've learned what the topics are that interest racers. And I decided, well, why don't we do something where we can reach more people than can go to an event? Why don't we do something where we can reach the world? And so, uh, People talked me into it and I committed to doing a virtual sponsorship summit. It's my first one. I have no idea how it's going to go. I'm, <laughs> I'm very frightened by technology. I'm not like you, you know, you're a tech expert. You've been doing <laughs> IT for a long time. I haven't. Um, I've been selling sponsorships for a long time. So I know the content and the speakers and I have a, a expert cast of panelists who are going to share information on sponsorships. I'm just hoping that the technology in the back end works and the thing gets recorded so that people can watch <laughs> it in the future. And uh, I hope the sound is good and the audio's uh, visual is good. Those are things I stress about right now because the summit is in eight days. It's next Friday, Friday the 17th. It's uh, all day long, essentially. I, I invited speakers and I had so many people respond and said, yes, I'll do it, that it ended up with 30 minutes per speaker. I had like nine hours of content initially <laughs> that I, I cut back <laughs> to six hours. I had to consolidate several sessions, cut out several of my own, um, put a lot of speakers together. So it's going to be a long day. It's around 10 a.m. to 4, 4.30 California time, uh, Pacific time, that is next Friday. Um, I'm hoping that the recording goes well so anybody who can't attend live will be able to then um, watch a, a, a recording of it. And we're going to learn from this and do it again at PRI in December. We'll host a sponsorship summit for those who can attend in person at PRI in Indianapolis. We'll do so, but those who can't, it should be streamed. And we'll learn, hopefully, from this first summit next week, you know, we'll work out <laughs> some of the bugs and, and learn what works and, and, and what doesn't. Well, going back to the uh, the topic of uh, uh, learning along the way and bringing everybody else with you. So <laughs> you're going to yeah, be doing uh -huh. exactly that. <laughs> And looking at the schedule here, you know, it was, it's funny, we've talked about pretty much the first half of the uh, the agenda, you know, talking about what sponsors want, decks and proposals, 
Uh, we're looking at tangibles and intangibles. We're looking at social media. You know, we've we've, <laughs> we've already led into half of your your presentation. Uh, uh, some interesting things on here. We got sim racing, which is virtual racing. We have mm-hmm. uh, LinkedIn, which is more business side of of your your program development, um, consistency and, and value, podcasts and YouTube and uh, magazines, events, all sorts of different stuff to talk about. And we have a pretty. I mean, if people aren't familiar with you know the world of racing and, and, and sponsorships you got a pretty stacked list of guests coming to to discuss this stuff with you you have you know presidents and and whatnot you have ceos you got uh you know, a lot of us in the in the in the suspension world are doing ibox springs the ceo of ibox coming you have matt martelli mm-hmm. who runs the mint 400 and and the california 300 and uh, mad media and a whole bunch of these different brands i i think he's you know he worked with uh rj anderson and all those guys you know back in the day on their videos and um you have uh our buddy george hamill showing up you got uh you got the you got joe parsons from monster energy that'll be a cool uh discussion too he's a cool guy um you have just a, a you got dave cole from king of the hammers and ultra four and That'll be interesting to see, you know, how he he comes across with the recent um, sell of some of the the racing program over to Mid America and, and you know focusing on King of the Hammers and and I think it was yesterday he just posted something about virtual King of Hammers, yeah. which is you know to, you know I'm the nerd I'm like totally into it Let, let's go do it let's try it like give me a headset. Um, yeah. he, he called me yesterday and he said, "Man, you are not going to believe what we did today." And then he started to explain to me what he, he's doing virtually and he sent me a video that showed it it's incredible um i'm gonna let him explain it and i'm gonna let him announce it <laughs> but what he's doing it's a game changer it really yeah. is no I, I think he you know is forward looking right he's he's trying to say this exactly. is a a, a very it, it's accessible you can go do it you can bring your razor down to california and participate in king of hammers all week and bring your toter and all that stuff uh but for the large majority of the interested audience they're gonna be staying at home watching the live feed you know, they've done a lot of cool stuff with drone and aerial stuff. They've done a lot of cool stuff and improvements with their production. And he's not satisfied, right? He's he's moving forward, moving the needle even further downrange. And I, and I applaud him for that. I mean, very few people have the guts to go into something that deep. And it's something that, you know, I, I look at that as if, Dave is an, an expert in his field and to, you know, as, as I am in, in certain things that I know, but I know nothing about sim racing that is worthy of actually trying to share or educate. So in, when it comes to the sim seminars, I have a couple sim experts. When I see somebody like Dave taking his platform of King of the Hammers and his ranch where he has the studio that he created this, this 3 and 4D, um, it is incredible because it shows that you don't age out of it. Old guys like us, we can still do new things and embrace new technologies. And guys, if if we can do it, you can do it. <laughs> and you know, one of the guests you'll be having on on the on the summit is Jim, our our buddy Jim Beaver, who's been on the show before. Yeah. Uh, and and he's an ex- perfect example of going from a son of a racer to a racer to an evolved racer to now being one of the lead. You know. Uh, owners of a of a team in e NASCAR and and yes. and sim racing and things like that, and he also has a serious show in it, which is you know just the the transition between radio and podcasting, right? So like he's he's a perfect example of somebody that's it's progressing over that arc and that curve of uh, new improvement, technology integration, adapting and and progressing forward. Jim is the perfect person when I when I was thinking of who to have discussing the the virtual world and the sim racing because i it's it's increasingly important uh, it, it didn't warrant more than a, one session on this upcoming summit although i'll probably do a sim sponsorship summit separately but it was it's something that needed to be discussed because it's one other way that a racer can add value to a sponsor that the summit is not for racers they're not only for racers looking for sponsorships. Yes, you'll learn how to find sponsors, how to approach them, how to create decks, proposals. You'll learn all that stuff, but that's a small part of it. It's it's how to increase your value to sponsors and how to increase your value to companies so they sponsor you. And one of the ways is using some of the tools that we didn't have before, whether it's social media, we're going to learn how to create value through social media or through virtual racing. And the virtual racing has many aspects to it. You can not just use sim racing to 
bring recognition to a new sponsor of yours because perhaps you mention them or you're able to use their graphics in the game. But you can also use the sim racing to improve your performance at a certain track that you don't get to practice at very much. If that track has a, a, a virtual race track or, or if they can race there at some point, you can you can practice and get better so that when you do go to the real track and race, now you already know where all the nuances are and you've, you've raced that track a hundred times, although never physically, the VR is getting so good that it actually allows racers to practice and get very close to real seat time. It, it's not actual seat time, obviously, but it's close to it. It's better than nothing. And so you can increase your value by increasing your performance and that's one of the things that those guys will talk about. Jim, Jim's legit because not only does he race side by sides, he has his own team. He's one of the one of only twenty e NASCAR franchise holders. He's I think fifteen years doing um, podcasts from Down and Dirty Radio Show. Now it's the Jim Beaver Show because it encompasses all types of racing, not just off road. But he speaks at this from all angles, so I can't wait to hear what he has to say and teach because uh, I'm also going to be open ears on that that episode or that <laughs> session. You know, what do we do to increase value in the virtual world to a sponsor that wants to reach the audience of that virtual world? Yeah, and I, I last time I had Jim on the show, I was talking about you know the e racing stuff is is one of those unique things that anybody can start doing. Um, at any point, right? Like you don't have to have a ten thousand dollar eSIM machine yeah, out in your garage to start. You can start with a computer and a, and a steering wheel, and just start the process, right? Like in content creation, the biggest roadblock is starting, right? Like we tell people all the <laughs> yeah, time, like yeah. how how do I get into YouTubing? How do I get into in social media and all? It's like, well, just start. Like the best thing you can do is just start. And uh, and so I also, you know, you hit on something about the value of of e racing and you know some old traditional type people would say that this is a waste of time you're best served to be out on the out in the dirt or in the garage wrenching or whatever uh but there's there's a certain acuity that comes mentally when you practice 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 no matter how that is right and like you're saying if you know the track and you know the turns through muscle memory not through you know a couple laps before the race mm -hmm. you're right. going to have that little bit of an edge before everybody else to know that it's in a pitch downhill left it's going to go hard right whatever you know those muscle memories are way more important than just a couple of physical laps on the track before the race. And that's just because it, the technology has improved so rapidly in the last few years. That opportunity, I don't think existed five years ago. Yes, there were virtual races. And in fact, back in 2006, or maybe it was 2007, we were approached uh, at core at championship off-road racing we were approached by a company in england that was creating this new video game called the colin mccray off-road rally um <laughs> colin mccray actually passed away in a in a helicopter crash uh, at some point during the 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 creation of that so they renamed the video game dirt right. but but we we created the very first dirt video game and at that time, a cameraman would come stand on the track. This, uh, I think they did the Chula Vista racetrack down in San Diego, which is now closed. It was a part of the landowner's uh, property. So we built an off-road track there. And the cameraman took one step and then took pictures with a 35 millimeter SLR, DSLR, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, took virtual photos or, or 360 degrees and then took another step, took all day to take step by step by step and took photos of the track and then took that back and incorporated that into a video game. And you could see our sponsor logos in the game. Uh, I know Skyjacker was there. There were several sponsors at the time that their banners were on the track, so they were included in the game. But back then, those video games were more about exposure and just you know who could navigate the, the game quickest, but you didn't have the feel of the track. Today, you can sit in a full-blown simulator and it's moving and shaking and bouncing. And it, like you said, it, it knows every angle, every cant, every turn. It knows the inclines and it can actually anticipate the impact um, if there is one. So it is far more realistic today than it was a few years ago. And because of that, people are getting better. Um, just like training to fly an aircraft or training to operate heavy machinery. It's, it's gotten so good and so accurate that people use that first to get better. And then they go on to their actual discipline, whether it's racing or working on, you know, or, or flying planes, I should say, or working on heavy machinery, then they can go do that more, more accurately and, and more professionally. I think with racing, um, every racer, every professional racer will soon have a simulator 
where they can practice off season and in between races. Right. Because if you're not, you're just getting that much further behind the competition. And, and that's why we included the sim racing session because it might not be there today um, as important as we think it will be in just a few years, but it is something that everybody has to be aware of and put on the radar. And if, and, you know, every piece of the puzzle counts when you're trying to add value for a sponsor. This is just one more way to add value, especially sponsors that are targeting uh, more progressive or younger youth. Yeah. And, and I think it goes also into the whole summit idea where you're listening to these people talk. It's not necessarily about like they're telling you that the ABCs of what you have to go do. It's more about here's what we're looking for as our side of the picture. This is what we expect you to try to do. And here's some ideas to fill the gaps on how you can accomplish that. Um, and I think like, like eSIM is that's more content too. Like, don't ignore the fact that this is content for you to start generating, right? Like every time there's a new puzzle piece, that puzzle piece should be generating more content for you. Right. And the more content you can generate, the more value and tangible that you're going to bring back to the discussion, mm -hmm. to the interaction, to the sponsor and, and all the above. And that's what, that's what Megan Meyer is going to get into. She's so good at this. I've never met her in person and I don't know her. Um, I didn't know her prior to interviewing her on my webinar, but I was so impressed with her knowledge and her content and what she was doing that I realized she has to be part of this because if she could teach me these things that I didn't know, she's certainly going to teach others, you know, the same things and more those, those who will apply it. I, I had a, a professional, I won't say her name, but a good friend of mine, uh, professional skateboarder, one of the biggest in the world. Uh, probably at one point she was the biggest in the world. She also snowboarded for the U.S. in the Olympics. She's a great, great You're athlete. really narrowing this down by not I'm, saying I'm narrowing it down. You, you can search her. You can search. She got so mad at me because we were talking about content. And I said, you know, you'll never, ever create content until you do one thing first. And this is super important because this is the one reason why most people don't get content is you have to find somebody with a thumb. You have to find somebody with a thumb, <laughs> a thumb to hit record, a thumb to hit stop, a thumb to hit upload, and a thumb to hit share. Until you find somebody with a thumb, you can't do anything. You can't create content. You'll never have anything online. And she looked at me and she's like, not sure if I'm insulting her or what, <laughs> but I'm trying to tell her anybody can do it because we, obviously we all have thumbs and we all have cell phones. So we can all become content creators instantly. <laughs> we can all become editors instantly and dis distributors of that content. Right. You know, we are, we are all personal media companies, anybody with a good cell phone. So I, I was listening to somebody um, on a podcast recently. I can't remember who it was, but their motto is ABC or always be creating. Right. Something like that. Always be ABR, always be recording. Um, I think it was actually Dax Shepard when Jim Farley interviewed him. Jim, Jim Farley now has a podcast called Drive. And, you know, when the CEO of Ford has a podcast, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> His first episode was with Dax Shepard, who's raced the Mint 400. And uh, he said that their, their motto on the set was always be recording. It was either that or it was Jimmy Kimmel. He, he interviewed both. One of those two said that. But it's so true in our world when you are a when, – when you're – just racing and you have enough money and that's all you want to do. You don't have to worry about it. But if you want sponsorship dollars, if you want corporate dollars to help with your program, you have to create value for those companies that you want as quote unquote marketing partners. And the, the probably the biggest and the most important value you can create for them is to capture content that they can't capture on their own because they're not there or they don't have access to the event or the resources or the behind the scenes um, access that you might have. So always be creating content, use your thumb, use your cell phone, use good quality video, good lighting, good audio, and you can send pieces of that to sponsors and brands and companies that they can use in their marketing. That has a lot of value to them, way more value than we realize. A lot of, a lot of racers, they'll, or not just racers, but any athlete, they'll create social media content and post it on their own social channel and they think that's enough. Well, a lot of these companies, they want to use that content perhaps in corporate meetings 
or in customer sales pitches or presentations to vendors and suppliers, or they want to use it maybe at an annual board meeting, or they want to use that content in a commercial. So if you're providing them with good content, you're giving them something that they need anyway, you're becoming an extension of their marketing arm, you're helping them do something, oh, well, there's no reason they wouldn't pay you for that. Instead of paying an employee, they're paying you as if you are that employee. And if the employees, let's say $100,000 a year, uh, marketing department, graphic artist, content person, um, why can't they give you that $100,000 to do that instead? Well, they can, and they usually do. So always create content and always realize that that content could have value for a company if it's presented in the right way. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that, like, because I'm, I'm a videographer, photographer, content generator. I have thousands of dollars worth of equipment when I go out to do stuff. You know, like I have professional level ability, right? And there's times where we'll be out with guys out in the dunes or in the mountains or whatever. And I might be a mile away, but something's happening in the moment. And the best thing that can happen is that one or two or three people can yeah. all get a shot of it with their iPhone. And one of them happens to do it in slow-mo. One happens to be, you know, Mr. Hmm. Techie knows how to get 4K high frame rate, whatever. Like, and then the other guy's just getting potato cam. Like they're all nice. capturing and ultimately speaking, what happens is that gets posted, goes viral, gets hundreds of thousands of interactions. Whereas if I came by with the camera and said, okay, hold on, let's do this. Let's hold on. Let's let, reposition, do that again. Let's get another angle. Like that production would have killed the moment. And so people don't realize that people don't realize that if they just take the moment to pull the phone out and do it, as long as it's not the worst potato cam in the world, you're going to be able to make a quality video that'll do more for you than if you paid somebody to be there all day making the shot. Yeah, no, that is true. We have we have the ability to not just create our own content through media or visual media like videos, but you can get on, I'm, I'm on your podcast today. You can come on my podcast. We can be on Jim Farley's podcast. We can be in magazines. We can be in newspapers. We can be in television shows. You can be on the microphone at a race. There, there's many ways that you can get visibility and have a voice to an audience. And one of the things that we're going to talk about, many of the things we're going to talk about at the summit on Fridays, you know, one of the sessions is how to get on the microphone, uh, how to get on, how to get into YouTube, how to get in podcasts, how to get in the media, how to get in newspapers. Um, we're going to have editors and publishers and writers for article or for magazines explaining if you want to get into PRI magazine or racer magazine, how do you do it? How do you approach this? If, if you want to create content for YouTube or be on a podcast, if you want to be on racers and rail cars, if you want to be on the dirt life show, how do you do it? So it's and I creating think it's your own that... content is good and, and showing your own content is good. But if you can create content and be in other people's content, other people's shows, other people's media, that just increases your value to your sponsors. And I think it's important to, to also know that you don't need permission to do this stuff. Like you, obviously oh, yeah. there's, there's corporate structure for things, but like you should not be sitting there waiting for somebody to reach out to you and be like, Hey, come get on the microphone for us this weekend or whatever. It's you yeah. have to be progressive with, I can do this. I'm going to try to get myself to be in a position to do that by connecting with these people, connecting with that business, interacting with that sponsored person by that company so that I can get it in with that company or, or whatever the case may be. And people don't realize that when you start doing that, you start connecting with those different content posters and you become a collaborator with that and your exposure exponentiates because of those interactions. But it doesn't happen because they called you to do so. It happens because you got out of your comfort zone and reached out to try to make things happen. It's true. It's, it's like media training. You know, the first time a, a young racer gets on the microphone because it's their first race in the podium, they're so nervous. They don't know what to say. They usually forget to thank friends and family and sponsors. And they answer whatever question is asked of them by the announcer. And they answer with one or two words because they're so frightened. They don't know what to say. But after a few times getting on the podium, now they remember to mention the sponsors. Now they start to thank their friends and family. And then after several years of getting on the podium, it just becomes so much more natural and so much more organic that it just flows. And, and creating content is the same. The first few times you do it, you're not going to like it. It's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to feel awkward and it'll probably look awkward. But as you start to do it more and more, it, you just start to settle in and you become more comfortable with it. So when it comes to creating high quality content, content 
content with value, you just have to do it many times. It, uh, there is a thing to say for repetition when it comes to right. video content, at least. And I think I think we need to not mix up the idea that quality, you know, and value are two different things. I think value is right. quality, and I think that's what you're saying is. We should not be looking at the production value. We should be looking at the intent and the storyline behind the content. And to also be clear, I think a lot of people misunderstand that content should be always video. Like content can be a lot of things. It could be a blog. It could be, you know, uh, Twitter. It could be, you know, things on site where you're actually handing out material that people will then between races or at lunch or whatever be, you know, engaged with in some way. Um, content could be you physically being a part of something. You know, it doesn't have to be that you're generating content. It's that you're creating situations where content can be made. Uh, I think that's super important for people. And I think this also is important to remember that this is not just racers. Like people could uh, attend this summit to listen yeah. to these people speak that are online personalities, guys that have big followings on Instagram, people that uh, are a brand business, a small bomb pop shop that's trying to figure out how to engage better um it could be a lot of different scenarios or even just like or or uh, an event promoter somebody that's trying to put together and build their events that they do every year they have a club that goes to the dunes uh you know once a year and does a big event they could do this summit and they could realize how to bring bigger better sponsors on board to make their events bigger and better and more inclusive of the community i was speaking with the cfo of um, a major company last night and he asked if it's possible to buy multiple tickets at a discount for 10 of his race teams. He said, you know, this is something that we already sponsor racers and lots of them, um, but there are a few of the newer teams that we'd like them to be educated on how to create more value f for us, especially through social media. Can we buy multiple tickets? And so you're right. It's not just for racers who are looking for sponsors or racers who are trying to increase their value to sponsors. It could, this, this summit is also for young marketing directors who want to learn more of the tools available and some of the processes that have been effective for others and for companies that want to educate their brand ambassadors how to be better brand ambassadors for them how to increase more value and one of the things you said just earlier about you know telling your story and content um, doesn't have to be video you're right if you have a compelling story that people can repeat that alone is content Word of mouth is probably the best marketing out there. And that's why brand ambassadors are so effective is because their followers trust what they say and, you know, rely on their advice. So word of mouth is very important. If you can create stories that people share verbally with their friends, even without having to watch a video, that is very, very, very powerful marketing. Uh, very powerful. So, yeah, I think it's it's. There, the world of working with brands and working with sponsors and working with uh, entities and, and uh, groups that want to build and support industries uh, is about the connection and the stories told after hours, right? Like we got so right. much that happens after five o'clock, right? Like we go to these, I talked before on, on a previous episode about, you know, we go to some of these big events that are out in the dunes or on out in the desert or, or whatever and the vendors all packed down at five o'clock, six o'clock, whatever the case is, right? And all their table uh, warmers all go home or go to the hotel or whatever. But the people that make the most impact stick around, hang around the campfire, have a beer, have a drink, have a, a plate of food with somebody and talk and experience together and, and relay those stories. And uh, one, of the, one of the ambassadors for um, a, a buddy that's on the show frequently, uh, Ian, he works for Full Throttle Batteries. Um, one of their sponsored athletes is um, Blake Wilkie and Blake Wilkie is sponsored by a number of larger off-road companies and things like that. He does a lot of unique builds that people get attention to and, and it creates stories and content. But what he also does is sticks around and does these things offline where he's creating nice. stories that people tell themselves further down the road and it just perpetuates these companies and brands that he works with. That's perfect. And that, that I think is brilliant. So I've gotten to know many of the companies I work with and I, I do sponsorship deals with. I've gotten to know the, the sponsorship directors and the executives there closely as friends. And that doesn't come through a boardroom meeting or through an email proposal or email communication. It comes from, like you said, sitting at the campfire, going to Camp Razor and hanging out 
afterwards, um, going to the Mint 400 or King of the Hammers or any of the NHRA, NASCAR, drag race, anything. It, it's going to the events and, and hanging out and spending time with people and not pitching them, but just getting to know them and le letting them get to know you and forming friendships. And even trade shows, you go to a trade show, you'd be surprised how many marketing directors get decks and proposals and handouts and marketing materials at trade shows that they never take back home on the airplane with them. They usually get thrown away, you know, into the trash at SEMA or at PRI. But because racers are using the trade show as a pitching opportunity, use the trade show as an opportunity to get to know somebody. And, and I find even at trade shows and, and certain events, like you said, after they pack up and close down at five o'clock, they go hang by the campfire. It's before when they're setting up and after when they're tearing down, those are great times to offer your help. Hey, do you guys need help carrying boxes? Do you need help moving this? Do you need help, you know, unloading? And of course, everybody else needs help. So that's a great way to get to know somebody is by helping them set up the booth or help them break down the booth and then hang out with them as they're having a beer afterwards and celebrating that it's all over. And so, yes, you're exactly right. A lot of these events, the campfire is the best place to get to know potential sponsors and at least let them get to know you. So when you do one day make that pitch, they know who you are. They know you're legitimate. They know you're credible. They know where you're coming from. And there's probably a greater likelihood that they'll sign on to it if they know who you are and you've hung out for a while. For sure. And, and I think it's important to understand how to approach these people. And I don't think you can know that unless you start to understand, you know, how they talk about stuff and how they in, interpret, mm. you know, ideas and, and all that stuff. And I think that's why things like this summit are so important, because if you can understand how these people that are in charge of sponsorships and money and, and allocations, how they think and how they talk, you'll get a better understanding of what they're actually looking for beyond what they've said there, you're going to see the intent and the emotional side of where they put their their connection in. And like you said, it, it all comes down to to bringing those two connection points together. And it's not about, you know, that piece of paper that you throw in the middle somewhere. So uh, this this sponsorship summit uh, is happening June 17th of this year uh, at 10 a.m. It's online via Zoom. So pretty much anybody around the world can participate in this. And like I said, it could be a sponsor, uh, a guy looking for sponsorship. It could be somebody just getting into racing where mom and dad just want to kind of know what this industry is like and, and what the expectations are. It could be, you know, the established racer where he lost sponsorships over COVID, right? And he has to rebuild his program from the ground yeah. up now and, and is trying to figure out what, you know, those lost connections, what they look like nowadays, because they, they're different. He doesn't have that personal connection anymore. Um, it could be somebody that's looking to get in e-racing. It could be somebody that's just trying to figure out social media. It could be somebody that's trying to build an event series or a brand. Um, so I think it really has a, a broad, a much more broad appeal than people might pigeonhole a sponsorship seminar about, right? And I think just a lot of times you hear stories at these things from these guys that you would never hear anywhere else really unless you're like close to them because whenever they're, these guys are around other people like them they tend to loosen up or have connections and, and bring stories together and, and reference back to a previous story things like that it's always a good time and I, and I thoroughly enjoy being able to hang out with these people in real life and it, it also translates over these types of online meetings as well so um, check it out uh, motorsports summit motorsports plural summit dot com uh, you can actually visit it via our link, sidebysideguys.link slash summit. Um, and if you land on that page, we'll get a little bit of, of credit credit for that. And, and we appreciate if you do that. Um, but uh, but what's the what's the pricing on the summit? Uh, you had a discount, and I think it recently changed uh, this last weekend. Uh, what's the pricing for, for the summit, and, and how can people sign up for it? The, the summit is $197 for the six hour all day plus access, free access to the recording um, forever. Um, for those who can't make the summit, there will be a recording online that they can purchase later. But anybody who attends live can, can participate in the sessions and obviously meet some of the speakers as well as watch the recording. Uh, just for your show, we have a 30% discount for your, your followers. Yeah, they can enter you have it? I do. I do. I'll, I'll throw it up on the screen here. It's, uh, <laughs> All right. it's a big Z30, big B-I-Z-3-0 for 30% off. That brings the price of admittance to the summit to, I think, just below 140 bucks. I'm not sure what it is. It's it's less than a, uh, one tire for your car. You know? <laughs> so I, I don't know. 
<laughs> yeah, so I can't do uh, math that fast so in my head. If you can do do us a favor and visit sidebysideguys.link slash summit, that'll take you straight to uh, the Ace Thriller um, website where you can purchase your tickets for the summit. Uh, and like he said, it'll be fully recorded so you can watch it live, but as also after the fact. So one of the things that, that I do on these types of things is I'll try to like write notes of time, like how, how far in, like it was roughly 15 minutes in, you know, sponsorship, uh, 25 minutes in, uh, Instagram or something like that to, then I can go back later and hit those things that I remember thinking that they were important. I don't have to take the notes like all the time while I'm listening. I can just do a time code of like, this is when I need to go back and look at it. Uh, so, uh, and then you can also refer back to it, you know, a year after you're like, uh, I'm all over the place. I need to get refocused. Let me watch that again. I, I do that frequently for some of these things that I attend. Well, I think the sessions, the two sessions that people will go back to the most will be to how to create a deck, what goes into it. Megan Meyer is going to go into literally using the tools on your computer. How can you put together a deck and what goes into it, how to create it, and then how to actually write a proposal the proposals can become the templates for legal documents. You know, the, the, the proposal is more of a word doc that a lot of times a company will cut and paste the deliverables from the proposal straight into a schedule A into an actual contract that then becomes legally binding. So you want to be very careful. And we're going to talk about what goes into each and how to create those. And Megan also is going to create a proposal template for anybody who doesn't want to make their own. You can go in and just sort of change certain um, aspects uh, some text and some images, and then you have your own. So I think those will be the two sessions people will go back to because those will have long-term future value and they become a resource more so than just a educational lesson. They, they actually become a, a, a asset that you have that you can use in the future. And that's, I think why if, I, hopefully it all goes well and the recording, you know, ends up well and, and all goes good. And it's our first time doing such a long summit on Zoom and Zoom, we're <laughs> relying on them to record this for us. So if it goes well, you'll get that recording and you'll always be able to go back to certain parts that you want to refer to again. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times uh, an email is turned into a contract. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's super important to uh, to know the scope of what you're doing and what you're saying and how it, how it affects the future. Uh, and that's a lot of times what, you know, some of us newer guys don't really understand when we say things on, you know, via text or, or email, or <laughs> if we're putting emojis yeah. in our email or in, in our proposals and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and so it's important to know that impacts. And, um, I think it might be interesting. Uh, I don't know if you guys have thought about this in the future, but just the business side of, of sponsorships, like how to prepare yourself as a team to handle finances and taxes and all that. I think that might be something mm -hmm. interesting down the road too. Cause I was just thinking about that the other day about, you know, some of the things I've worked with it. How, how do I, how do I keep track of that and, and report that? Cause it, it makes a big difference and you don't want to be a team where you get big sponsorships and at the end of the year, all of a sudden you're upside down. Yeah. Good point. And, and not just the financial end in terms of accounting and, you know, debits and credits, but proper use of the sponsorship funds, some people go out and they buy a new boat or a new car. Some will actually buy new parts for their car and make it faster. Um, I always recommend take 20, 30%, take a substantial portion of the sponsorship dollars that you receive and reinvest that into marketing of your team that promotes your sponsor. Get a good publicist, buy some ads, buy some time in a magazine, or maybe boost some posts if it's a really good one. Use that money to promote as a marketer might use that money to promote, become the marketer for them, you know, be become an extension of the marketing staff and spend that marketing budget the way they might. And that, that way, at least you know that you're getting, that the sponsor is getting a value with what you're doing with their money, as opposed to just you spending the money and it disappears. Right. The, that sponsor dollars is to create sales for the sponsor, and it's good to reinvest some of that into things that might generate sales for the sponsor. One of the best tips I've heard um, from somebody on that topic was to start creating content like they are creating content. Don't you don't have to be you know coming up with this a bunch of original stuff. If you have to copycat the sponsor they're going to look at that and be like, oh, I thought that was, oh, that, that's not part of our team. Uh, let, let's figure out how to get you a part of our team because it, mm. it fits right into what we're doing. The bigger companies have consistent images. You know, they, they have logo guidelines, vendor guidelines. They're very specific on how you can use their logo, their color, um, very specific. And so 
they try to cater their marketing and in a certain way and they want all the images to look the same. So yes, you're exactly right. And when you are dealing with a certain brand, understand its image. Maybe there's a certain coloring that they only use certain Pantone colors, or maybe there's a certain format, or maybe the background is always blurred and there's a highlight in the front. It's, but they have a certain style. And if you can replicate that with what you're doing and it fits into their style, they're far more likely to use the content that you give to them, which then doesn't just promote the sponsor. It promotes you, your team, and it promotes other sponsors on your team that are getting visibility through whatever sponsors, that the one sponsor's marketing. So yes, you're right. Keep know, know the sponsor's image and try to maintain that image for them. Very important for the big brands. So one of the things I like to do wrapping up episodes is to kind of ask what you're looking forward to. Like we're, we're getting close to halfway through the year. So it was more important like, a, you know, in January's episodes. But, you know, the, the show season and the race season is all kind of just getting rolling and getting started. We've had a couple Baja <laughs> things go on. We've mm -hmm. had a couple you know, different race series kick off and whatnot. But what are we, what are you looking forward to as somebody that's in the, uh, the business side of racing? What are you looking forward to for the rest of this season and possibly into 23? Well, aside from maybe a double wide drag race that I'd like to go to, to show my, <laughs> show, show my sons, you know, what it's like, uh, when you, when you hear four cars going off at once, that's pretty insane. Um, the biggest thing I'm looking forward to is the California 300. It's a new race that's going to be held out of Barstow this fall. Um, Matt Martelli from the Mint 400, he and his brother Josh are putting on the California 300. It's going to be a California-based race just like the Mint 400. Um, and Barstow's no joke. <laughs> Barstow's no joke. I used to live at Fort Irwin in the 80s. My dad was stationed there. So I got to know some people at Fort Irwin. Long story short is I do tours at Fort Irwin, and I know some people there. So if all goes well, there should be um, some very interesting assets at the California <laughs> 300 that the U.S. Army is going to going to nice. donate for the event from tanks to Blackhawks to some pretty cool things. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Yeah. When that was announced, I was, I was, my curiosity was definitely peaked having uh, grown up in, in Yuma uh, and frequently going to Barstow for friends and family and all that stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting now that it's become off roads, become such a big, good sport that a Barstow is starting to become more, more popular uh with these guys that are out in the desert so uh yeah it'll be interesting to see how that race goes off first time events are always interesting to see how they how they roll out and, and end at the end of the day so uh and knowing the martellis obviously they're not going to hold back anything so uh no, that'll be and, super and because interesting it's, be, because it's in barstow um it's going to be sort of a merging of the mint 400 and the utv world championship because they'll have the utv classes there side-by-side -side classes, as well as the motorcycle classes, as well as all the, the desert classes. So um, it should be good for everybody. Yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, so uh, you can visit uh, sidebysideguys.link slash summit to get to Alex's Motorsports uh, Summit. That's going to be covering sponsorships and and all sorts of different angles with content and, and social media and publications and, and brand identifying and, and all this other stuff. Uh, super important, like we said, applies to lots of different niches. So if you're just curious on how to work better with brands and with uh, sponsors that maybe not even directly sponsoring you, just you're working with them, uh, understanding how they work, how they think, what they're looking for is always super important to have a good grasp of. Um, and uh, it should be a good time. Like he said, it's about seven hours, eight hours, somewhere in that range. Uh, it's a full day experience. It's <laughs> right. like if you went to a trade show, right? And uh, it'll be a long one, but the the nice thing about being online is you can sit there in your in your basketball shorts and eating uh, Dorito chips and slugging a Mountain Dew, and 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 no one would know the difference. <laughs> so that's true. That's uh, true. It's it's the professional summit where you don't have to be professional because you're just watching. So, uh, <laughs> so if you want to attend, uh, link slash summit Use the promo code generously donated uh, by Alex Big Z thirty for thirty percent off. That'll bring the cost down below one hundred and forty bucks. Uh, and uh, you know, if you have a buddy that's part of your race team or you know a partner in the business or whatever. You can put it up in the conference room and watch it. The whole team can watch it, whatever the case is. Um, and if you want to do, you know, if you are a, a company that does sponsor multiple teams or, or things, racers like that, and you want to get them involved, you can reach out to Alex uh, to to look at, you know, bulk pricing, things like that. Um, and uh, it should be an interesting time uh, to see, you know, just all these interesting people tell their stories. 
uh, get to know them a little bit better. And at the end of the day, make us all better educated and better, uh, better people in the industry that make our industry grow better. And I mean, I think that's, that's just something I really have pressed to this, this last year is let's together as a community, let's build this thing to be what we want it to be. And let's, let's not let Amen. it just evolve into whatever it ends up being. Amen. I'd much rather see a lot of racers each get a chunk of a large sponsorship than one major sanctioning body or entity get all the money. It, you know, growth in motorsports is going to start at the ground level up as racers and teams become more funded, then they can race more events, they can create more media, they can promote the races more. That's how motorsports is gonna survive and grow. It doesn't come from giving one sanctioning body large amounts of money hoping that they create media from it. It comes from the racers, the ones who are behind the wheel, in the car, at the events, creating the event, part of the entertainment. And, and if racers can get more funding, I think it raises the value for, of all motorsports and it keeps our industry alive. Absolutely. So uh, thanks for coming on the show today. I thought it was super interesting to kind of dive into all this that you've been working on and, and hopefully we can work more in the future. I think there's a lot of ideas I have rolling around my head that I'd love to talk with you about. Um, and I know that our buddy George talks with you all the time and uh, he's going to be a part of the show, helping you get this thing pulled off uh, next week and, and all that. So uh, best of luck uh, with the show, getting that all done. Hopefully the Zoom gods will rain upon you and you'll have a great time. <laughs> quality content to distribute after that and uh until the next time guys you can find us on uh apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify iHeartRadio, all those different places where you enjoy your podcast as well as youtube where you can go and see uh alex's beautiful gray mane of hair and his beautiful <laughs> face so uh go check him out uh at uh alexstryler.com if you want to see or um uh what's the other website meet the sponsors.com and uh, check out some of the content he's already produced for free that you can go check out now uh, before the summit. And then after the summit, you can also uh, go back and watch uh, the sponsorship summit again once you've taken your notes. So uh, enjoyed having you on the show. Thanks for coming and everybody. Peace. Peace.